What is Gaussian itself? Basically, it's a software that utilizes computational chemistry to simulate a bunch of different properties for molecules. Under all those properties, you can simulate electronic energy, geometry, vibrational frequencies, and specifically in infrared and Raman, which is the purpose of this webinar. You can do intrinsic reaction coordinates, potential energy surface, relative stability, NMR chemical shifts, dynamics of a molecular, molecular system, and electrostatic potential. You have a lot of different options when it comes to Gaussian, and it's very, very versatile. It's very robust, and I fully recommend this software for simulations. Now, I'm going to be focusing specifically on how to simulate the vibrational frequencies in Raman and infrared. So I'm going to be talking a way that you can follow me if you're using the program. You don't have to use it right now. This is going to be saved and uploaded to YouTube. So you can at least have it at the side when you're creating your molecule. OK, so let's start with creating a molecule. The first thing that we're going to do is select the element fragment, fragment icon on the Gauss View program. Now, Gauss View is a different program than Gaussian. Gaussian is the program where you do the simulation. Gauss View is an interface that allows you to set up everything. It's going to be translated into code, which is then going to be ran on Gaussian. Okay? So you're going to open up your Gauss View and you're going to click on the element fragment icon. When you do this, you're going to have the following option. And in this option, you can choose a specific element that you want to choose to create your molecule. And you can go element by element constructing your molecule. Now, when you select a specific atom, you can then choose the type of fragment of that specific atom. The, type, the number of bonds that's going to have, if it's uh, only the atom of that specific element, etc. Once you know which fragment you're going to use, you're going to left click on that specific option, and then you're going to see a specific screen below the menu of Gauss View. In that screen, you're going to click with the left click once more, and then you're going to see that specific fragment. In this case, it's basically carbon with four different hydrogens along it. So that's what we can do to start creating our molecule step by step. You select the specific element, select the specific fragment, and then you click on the specific place where you want it to pop in. So let's say that you want a ramification for that specific compound. In this case, I'm going to click on the R group fragment icon, which is at the, the right side of the element fragment icon. And there you're going to see different types of ramifications. And similar to the elements, you select the type of ramification you want. That's going to be then selected on the Gauss View interface. And when you click on a specific atom, let's say the one, the hydrogen above the carbon, it's going to replace that hydrogen with the ramification that you selected. So then when you already have your, your molecule, I'm going to do a very small one as a demonstration. However, when you have your molecule, you can then adjust the geometry by clicking the clean icon. This is going to do a very slight um, adjustment, what it thinks at first glance that it might look like based on basic um, geometry of molecules, and then you can also impose a point group symmetry by hitting the icon symmetrize. This is going to allow you to have a more symmetric molecule. It's not going to force it beyond its capabilities. It's going to give you the most symmetric that it can be. Once you select it, it's going to adjust it and then let me click on this specific pen. I want it to be yellow. You're going to see its point group below. This is very, very useful. If you want to study for inorganic chemistry, you can draw the molecules in Gauss view 
it symmetrizes, and you can see the point group symmetry of that specific molecule. So this can also be very, very helpful for study. Now, once we do that, we're going to start with the Raman and infrared simulation. So you already have your molecule, you drew it, you then hit the clean to adjust the geometry, you then hit symmetrize to adjust and impose a specific point symmetry. Then you're going to click on calculate and you're going, going to select Gaussian. When you do this, you're going to have a new window and in that window, you're going to go to the job type um, tab. And there on this specific menu, that's for the specific job you want to do, you're going to select opt rec. This specific job is going to perform the optimization job and then it's going to perform the frequency job. Optimization is going to go into a very robust set of calculations to determine what's the most optimal geometry for that specific molecule. And once you do that, it's going to then simulate what would be the specific frequency for the vibrational modes of your molecule. Okay, so it's going to basically hit two, burn, two birds with one stone. Okay, so again, this is the specific window we are on Gaussian calculation setup. We are on the job type tab and we selected the job in this specific menu, which is opt prec. After you do this, you're going to go to the menu at the right where it says compute Raman. And it's basically going to give you three options. Either say it's a default, say no, I do not want to compute Raman, or say yes, I want to compute Raman. Since I do want to compute Raman, I'm going to choose yes. Then we're going to go to the method tab. This is the one that's going to be a little bit more complicated, a little bit more um, difficult. However, there are specific things you can do in order to know what is the state that you're going to be using, what is the level of theory they're going to be using, the spin state they're going to be using, the hybrid functional, and in this case right here, the basic set, the charge of the molecule, and the spin state of the, for the specific molecule. All of those things, you can determine them um, specifically depending on a couple of factors. I'm going to be showing them right now. So for the electronic properties, depending on what you want to do, I have created a flowchart that basically tells you what option to use depending on the answer that you have for the questions. So you want high accuracy for electronic properties? Yes, you're going to use this option. You do not want high accuracy, you're going to go to the second option right here. It's going to say, OK, so you want, does your molecule have heavy atoms or transitional metals? If your answer is yes, you're going to be using this option. If your answer is no, you're going to go here. And basically, if you don't have any more options, you're going to go on ground state. Okay. Normally, I choose ground state. That's the one that I choose for my calculations. It has given me very similar results. Whenever you want to try to simulate something, First, have a molecule that you do know the specific thing that you want to simulate, and then you try the different configurations that you want to use and compare the results from the simulation with the results that you acquired experimentally. If they are close, then you can rest assured that that specific molecule, that specific configuration is going to help you to simulate it. Okay? So you're gonna choose a molecule that's similar to yours, but one that you already know its experimental property. So this is the thing that you can do for the electronic properties. Normally I use ground state. Now, let's say that you want to know the level of theory that you're going to be using for your calculation. Once again, you have your flow charts. Does it have heavy, heavy atoms or transitional metals? If you're saying yes, you're gonna use these two different options. If the answer is no, the, do you want high accuracy for electronic properties? Your answer is yes, you can use these two options. If your answer is no, do you want high accuracy for thermochemistry properties? 
yes, this, no, do you have halogens or you want high accuracy? If your answer is yes, you can use these two. Does compute computational cost, is it a concern that you have computational cost, meaning that you have a computer that is not really that fast? Maybe it's gonna take a couple of time to do the simulation. Are you willing to deal with that? If the answer is yes, you can use DFT. If the answer is no, then you can use R3-5. Okay, so those are the options you have for level of theory. Which is the one that I use? Normally I use density, density functional theory, DFT. It's a very, very secure option. I prefer it most of the time. It does have a lot of computational cost, but it is very efficient in order to use. Okay. Now, with the hybrid functionals, same thing, flow charts, does it contain metals or transitional metals? If you say yes, you can use these two options. Does it have allergen, allergens or heavy atoms? If you say yes, use these options right here. Do you need high accuracy for electronic properties? If the answer is yes, you use these two right here. If the answer is no, does it have conjugated system or aromatic molecules? If the answer is yes, use these two right here. If no, but there's computational concern, then you can use this one. So which one is the one that I use mostly? I normally use, I'm not gonna put the star right here because I'm going to imply that I use both. Normally I use B3O YP and I use B3 PW91, okay? This is basically the letters for the people that determined or discovered the algorithm Beck, Ling, Yang, Par, if I'm not mistaken, for Betrayal YP. Um, but yeah, those are the two that I mostly prefer whenever I do my simulations, Betrayal YP and b 3 pw 91 Now, for the basic steps, same thing, flow charts, is computational cost a burden? If the answer is yes, we're going to use this one. If the answer is no, does it have a heavy atoms? Yes, you're going to be using these ones right here. Does it have high accuracy for thermal, thermal chemistry properties? If the answer is yes, you use these two right here. Does it have transitional metals? Yes, you use this. Does it have allergens? Yes, you use this. Do you have moderate accuracy for geometry or energies? If the answer is yes, use this. If the answer is no, is computational cost a concern? Yes, you're going to be using this one. Does it have heavy atoms or require high accuracy? The answer is yes, you're going to be using these two right here. Okay, so which one is the one I use? Same as for the hybrid functionals, the ones that I use are two different ones, basically 6311G and CCP. BQC. These are the two that I mostly use. I have a specific paper that's going to be published in the future where I simulated 52 different peroxide explosives. And when I use different configurations, the ones that gave the best results were using these two basis sets in combination with Vitria YP and b 3 pw 91 ground state, and DFT. So those are the ones that I personally use the most. However, here you have specific flowcharts in order for your specific needs. Now, for the spin states, if you have an open shell, you're going to be using this one right here. Do you have multiple unpaired electrons? You're going to be using this. Should that be radical? To use this. Is it a highly conjugated or aromatic molecule? You're going to use this. Is high accuracy required for electronic properties? You're going to be using this. And same as before, this is the one that I use specifically singlet. Now, those are the different um, configurations that I use for my specific molecule ground state, DFT. Singlet, B3, LYP, 
N6311G. Those are the ones that I use the most whenever I'm doing my specific simulations. Depends a lot on the molecules. Normally I use ones that are aromatic and that contain nitrogen or peroxide. Those are the ones that I've been using the most. However, there you have your flowcharts just in case. Now, we already did the job type, which is OptFrec, the one that we're going to be performing, OptFrec. For the method, we use this one right here. And for the title, the title is very simple. You simply put the specific molecule that you want to um, simulate. Normally, I do that. I place the job type that I'm going to be using. I place the basis set that I used and the hybrid functional, followed by the date. This is the specific run for one of the molecules that I did for my study. So this is how I personally place the name when I'm doing my simulations. If you're just doing one configuration, you can simply put, put the molecule name and the date. But it's very important that you place the date because the date is going to be giving you um, a bit of more leeway whenever the molecule might stop and you don't know if you already ran the molecule, if you had to do another run by some by some chance to know how many times did it basically pass before it completed its simulation, et cetera, et cetera. Normally, I like to have the date. Okay. But it's simply the title. You put whatever you want. Now, uh, for the general part, I leave it as default. The guess, I leave it as default. Link zero, you don't touch that part. Normally, if the molecule um, stops and one of the errors says that it basically doesn't have enough memory, you can go to the link zero tab and you can basically increase the amount of MW which I'm not very sure right now where it means because it doesn't sound like something that it might mean. But normally that's the specific amount of memory that you place for them for the simulation. So if it says low memory, increase the value there and run the simulation again. General and guess, you stay the same. And bio natural bond orbital, I normally do not work with that, but I can help you get the charge for each atom at that specific molecule. And for the solvation, you can put the specific solvent that you want to induce the molecule for the simulation. Normally, I prefer to run them normal, neat, right? Normally without any solvents. But if you're working with NMR, it is very, very important to consider the dielectric, dielectric constant of the solvent that's normally gonna be placed for that specific molecule. So there, it is very, very, very important to select the specific solvent that you want to use. So here we have all of the different selections for solvation. I'm going to be placing none because I do not have a solvent for that specific molecule. However, if you were to have a solvent, normally I prefer to use this option right here, and then you select the specific solvent. Okay, so once you have everything set up, remember, Everything that we're doing right here is for the Gauss view interface. All of this, all of this information is being translated into code, and then it's going to be sent to Gaussian in order to um, perform the simulation. So once you have everything, you can hit submit. Then you're going to be selecting the place where you want to have the output be placed. I'm going to place it on my desktop. I have the name right here. Very important, the file type, it must Gaussian input file and save as must be Gaussian input file also. Normally, one of those options are not placed by default. And if you click save, you're going to have an error. You have to place on them both Gaussian input. Okay. So once you do that, you're going to be clicking save. And then the simulation is going to be performing. Normally, you're going to have this specific window. And in the lower left part of the window, it's going to be saying the status of the simulation. It's going to be saying, like, we're calculating um, coordinates, we're calculating integrated um, coordinates, 
speaking with coordinates in this case. But it's going to be giving you all the information of all the things that are being calculated at the moment. Once it runs, once the simulation is completed, you're going to have this pop up window. Where it's going to say Gaussian job has completed. Do you want to close the Gaussian window? If you hit yes, you're going to close the window with the simulation. You're not going to lose any progress. All of the progress and all of the information is already being stored on a dot log file. Okay, on a dot log. This is going to be the file of your output. Of your output. The dot g j k, if I'm not mistaken, that one is the file for your input. Okay. Very important to know the difference between the two. Another thing is that the simulation, the when it stops, when it already completed the job, is going to give you a little quote. The quotes always change, which is very cute. I like that. And then it's going to give you the job that that specific molecule took. In this case, this took like one minute because I'm showing an example of something very, very small. In this case, is um, methane, if I'm not mistaken. So very small molecules, not going to take that much. However, depending on the size of your molecule, that time is going to vary, but it's going to vary, very, very much. Okay, so be prepared <laughs> for that. I've had molecules that have taken me weeks, and I've also had molecules that have taken me months. Okay, I had one specific molecule that took me around six months. So very careful with the program. Ensure that once the simulation is running, your computer is not going to shut down. Have it connected. Uh, don't have a screensaver. Leave it so, just as it is. Have a battery backup in case the electricity goes out. Okay, all of those things is very, very important when you're using Gaussian. There is the option to have a checkpoint file. Normally, this is the ex extension of the checkpoint file. Personally, I have not been able to use them effectively. Whenever I try to use them, I basically almost start from zero. So I prefer to start from scratch all of the calculation. However, you have the possibility to have a checkpoint file where if you, for any chance, something happens, you can then restart where you left off. Okay, so we already saw how to construct the molecule. We saw how to create the job that we specifically want. We saw how to submit the job. And now we're going to see what are the outputs. Specifically, we run, we ran a optimization for geometry, and then we determined the frequencies in infrared and Rama. So let's see what we do with the results. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look up for the dot log file. Very important. Dot log file. This is the output from Gaussian. You're going to be clicking open. However, normally when you use it on a computer, it's going to be read as a text file, as a .txt, which you can actually open. You're going to see basically all of the calculations that were done. But normally you want to see other things. So if you want to see a more um, helpful interface, you're going to be using, again, DOS view. So we're going to right click the file. We're going to choose open with, and then we're going to choose Gauss view. Okay. So in Gauss view, you can then go to results and then click summary. And it's going to give you a summary of the job that was done for that specific simulation. Now, in this case, this is not what you get in summary. In summary normally you get um the type the type of job that was performed, the energy of the molecule, you're gonna get the time that it required to do the simulation. What we're going to be seeing right now, which is an, an error from here, we're going to go to vibrations. This option right here on the bottom. Going to go to vibrations. In vibrations specifically, you're going to see the molecule that we ran with the vectors where the molecules are going to be vibrating. 
and you're going to have a table with all of the vibrational modes of that specific molecule. Okay, this is a very, very, very helpful part of the simulation. You can see every frequency, their vibrational modes, and if you click on start, you can even see it moving. It is very, very helpful. In this case, we're going to be seeing the spectrum option, okay? the spectrum option. And in that option, you're going to get the infrared spectra of the molecule and the Raman spectrum of the molecule. One of the things that I do not like about Gaussian and specifically Gauss view the interface is that it does not let you output the frequencies with the intensity values. It just shows you the graph of the molecule. Normally you want to graph it if you want it for a specific project, paper, um, poster, etc. So there are different options that we can use for that specific thing. One of them is using the one that I will be focusing on is using Gauss sum. This is a program that's completely free. Gaussian and Gauss view are not free. But Gossam is free. It's, it was made by a specific professor. I do not know the name right now. But this program, you can download it from the internet free. Once you have it, you're going to click open. And then when you have the specific um, window of Gossam, you're going to click on file and you're going to click on open again. This open is going to be for the specific molecule. So we're going to basically go and search our molecule, which is the one that has the dot log extension, and we're going to click open. Once we click on that, you're going to go to the frequencies option. And this specific program, like it, it's such a great program for in order to be free, and I love it. Basically, you can specify the start frequency for your spectra the final frequency of your spectra, the amount of points so you can basically set a specific resolution for the spectra, the full width at height maximum for the peaks. You can have a scaling factor in order to correct for the frequencies. You can set for Raman specifically, you can set the specific wavelength of the laser that you want to use for that specific molecule and the temperature where it's going to be having for the simulation. You can set all of those things and then click on this specific icon right here, and it's going to then give you the output. This is mind blowing because specifically for Raman, normally, depending on the budget, depending on what's available at the moment, you have a specific um, excitation line. You might have a 785 nanometer laser, you maybe have a 5. 32 nanometer laser. You maybe have a 1064, et cetera. So those peaks are not going to be, they're not going to have the same intensity. So it's very, very useful that this program allows you to simulate that specific frequency. So blew my mind. I love this program. Once you have this specific graphs, you can save the graphs, but that's not the only thing that you can do. You can then go to a folder it's going to be creating um, automatically that's called Gaussum 3. You're going to click open. And in that folder, you're going to have the data in order to graph the infrared spectrum and the Raman spectrum for that specific molecule. Okay, So this is amazing. You can then go to um, Excel, go to data, and basically use the TXT or the CSV option, and you can open the, the text file and then import the data in CSV um, to Excel. And then you can graph your spectrum and you're all good to go, okay? So basically all of this is how you can use Gaussian in order to simulate a specific spectrum. Going back here, you can see that the results are very, very impressive for a specific molecule. If you do not have a reference for a molecule, this is a good start, a good educational guess.
still have the molecules on it. If you cannot find the NS spectra, for example, you have the option for infrared and Raman. You have the option for NMR also for the frequencies. And normally you're going to have a slight shift on the wave numbers, but you can use some formulas in order to correct for those inaccuracies. If I'm not mistaken, Yoshida, a specific um paper from Joshida has an equation that allows you to correct for the frequency. Normally, if I took the spectra for that molecule, I already corrected with a reference, then I can use that as a reference and I only shift it like that and you have your results. So this is all for now. Here are the reference that I use for my work and I thank you all for your attention.